This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The Quarantine Report. I'm Amy Goodman in New York, where the COVID numbers are going up, uh, joined by my co-host Juan Gonzalez in New Jersey, where the numbers are escalating alarmingly. Hi, Juan. Hi, Amy, and welcome to all of our listeners and viewers across the country and around the world. Well, over 1,700 people died from COVID Tuesday in the United States. It's the deadliest day of the pandemic in at least six months. As public health officials across the country brace for a COVID-19 surge from the Thanksgiving holiday and already record high infection rates, some Republican governors are dropping their resistance to mask mandates, including Iowa Governor Kim Reynolds, who imposed a limited mask mandate Tuesday. But many of these same governors continue to hold off on implementing other public health measures. In Texas, where coronavirus cases have reached record highs for a second time in the pandemic. Governor Greg Abbott says no new lockdown is coming. He's even pushing back on local policies in places like El Paso County, along the Mexico border, which is facing one of the worst COVID-19 outbreaks in the country. After the Texas attorney general sued to stop an order closing non-essential businesses in El Paso, a Texas appeals court agreed with the challenge Thursday, which allowed businesses to open the next day. About 80 percent of El Paso residents are Latinx. The county now has 10 mobile morgues to hold bodies. Some prisoners are being paid just $2 an hour to move the bodies, as the numbers of cases and deaths has completely overwhelmed the hospitals. They are moving the corpses. A traveling nurse who worked at the El Paso University Medical Center spoke out about what she called a horrific scene for patients with COVID-19. In a Facebook video earlier this month, Luana Rivers also described a room she calls the pit, where she says patients were sent to die with minimal treatment. They did not aggressively treat them as they should have. Uh, and according to their staff, the doctors at the hospital wasn't aggressive before COVID, but even with COVID. So I saw a lot of people die that I feel like shouldn't have died. Y'all, that assignment there broke me. Uh, I was put in what's called a pit. And in this pit was eight patients, all COVID positive. My first day of orientation, I was told that whatever patients go into the pit, they only come out in a body bag. The patients that we called it, we were not allowed to bag them because we would get too much exposure, which I hadn't seen. Um, and because they were COVID positive, this hospital's policy was they only get three rounds of CPR, which is only six minutes. There's, out of all the codes that we had there, there's not a single patient that made it. Y'all, this, when I say this assignment here, uh, like, literally almost destroyed me. Like, I have, I called my husband from there, I called my best friend from there, and I just cried. And I just said, what I'm seeing here is just not right. That's visiting nurse Luana Rivers describing a hospital in El Paso. Well, for more, we go to El Paso to speak with Dr. Emilio González Ayala, a leading pulmonary disease and critical care specialist. Thanks so much for taking the time, Dr. Ayala, to speak to us today. If you can start off by describing the situation in El Paso so extreme uh, that the county uh, administrator uh, tried to put major restrictions in El Paso, and the governor prevented them from being implemented? Yeah, unfortunately, uh, we've uh, been facing these uh, decisions by the government uh, of the state. And uh, obviously, as you mentioned before, the mandate to uh, close non-essential businesses has impacted us in a significant way, because we continue to see the surge of numbers in the hospitals and the ERs throughout the city. And we're at capacity. We're uh, beyond the limit uh, where we can continue to uh, admit to the hospital patients that come in 
critically ill, and we're flying them out directly from the ER to other hospitals in the state where they can be admitted and treated. Uh, we are keeping a large number of intubated, mechanically ventilated patients in the ER waiting for beds to open in the ICU, but sometimes uh, these patients are um, too unstable and too critically ill to continue waiting there. So we need to make space for them by either moving the stable patients in the ICU or flying out the stable ones that are in the ER. And, and Dr. Gonzalez, I wanted to ask you about uh, also the situation in Juarez, which is off across the border, right across the border. Uh, it's often called the sister city of El Paso. It's actually, some people would argue that El Paso is actually a suburb of Juarez, which is such a much, much bigger a city. Uh, your sense of how the, the, the close relationship between these two cities has affected the COVID uh, pandemic one way or the other? Well, it's it's the same city in, in essence. It's it's called the Metroplex, uh, Juarez El Paso, and uh, obviously we have a lot of patients that are U.S. residents and U.S. citizens that reside in, in the other side of the of the border, and they can come in legally, obviously, and request to be seen and treated in El Paso as their their rightly citizens or residents. And obviously, we're seeing those patients come across the border. Uh, that impacts also our ability to continue to, to treat patients in the hospital. And they're at capacity as well. There's no place in Juarez, no hospital in Juarez that has available beds. So it's, it's the same situation in essence. Dr. Gonzalez, oh, sorry, go ahead, and this whole issue, uh, This whole issue of the uh, refusal of state officials uh, to uh, allow the municipality and the local officials to uh, to implement the kinds of restrictions uh, on, uh, on, pu on public gatherings and and uh, that uh, that you want to have. What's the impact of that on your being able to curb the pandemic? Well, obviously, we are not going to be able to curb uh, that uh, surge in numbers without those mandates. Uh, obviously, we're entering the influenza season, and we already are seeing patients presenting with both infections, with influenza and with COVID. Obviously, that doesn't help at all. Um, we're pleading with the public to uh, avoid visiting or bring in visitors during the holidays. Thanksgiving is next in the next couple of weeks. We're asking them not to uh, relax precautions and to avoid uh, getting even their neighbors into their uh, houses to, to celebrate. I think uh, if we want to continue to celebrate uh, these holidays next year, we need to uh, set out this one. Can you talk, uh, Dr. Gonzalez Ayala, about um, the rationing that we're hearing? Um, we're hearing that the county judge, Ricardo Samaniego, has said that care is being rationed in El Paso hospitals. And can you talk about what that traveling nurse said, the horror of nurses working in the pit, leaving doctors not being able to go into that area or not going into that area? people just being left to die, and then prisoners being paid something like $2 an hour to move corpses, we're talking 10 mobile morgues that have been set up, all of this. So, I, I am in private practice. Uh, although I have privileges at University Medical Center, I don't practice there. So, I cannot speak to the situation at UMC. I haven't been there in a while. I, I am familiar with the with the Facebook video that this nurse posted. I know my colleagues in UMC and Texas Tech University Health Sciences Center, which uh, staffs that hospital uh, very well. And I am I'm not sure that I can uh, fully believe that account. Uh, these are very humane, very ethical, very professional physicians. I don't see that really happening. I, 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 I doubt it, but I haven't been there. I can tell you that care is not being ra uh, rationed in the um, private hospitals where I practice. Yes, we're overstretched. We are having to 
receive help from FEMA with physicians, nurses, respiratory therapists, nurse practitioners. Uh, we're grateful that uh, we're receiving this help to staff the hospitals and continue to deliver the care that we alone, the, the people that live here in El Paso, the physicians that work here in El Paso, cannot provide on our own without that help. But we are not rationing care. I mean, we're limited by the number of beds we have available, but we're not deciding who lives and who dies. And that would be unethical and illegal. So uh, I don't see that happening uh, at this point in the facilities where I practice. And, and Dr. Gonzalez, I wanted to ask you about the, uh, as a frontline worker facing this uh, pandemic, uh, not only the problems that you see at the state level, but also at the national level, when you find uh, that are uh, the uh, the White House itself uh, often uh, makes contradictory statements to those of the health professionals at the Centers for Disease Control and the National Institutes of Health. Uh, your sense of what the impact of these mixed messages from uh, the political leadership uh, has the impact it has on your ability to work uh, on the front lines. Well, I think that the the medical community. Um, has better judgment uh, and uh, understands that when, for example, Dr. Fauci uh, speaks, uh, uh, he he speaks with the truth. And I think we mostly follow his advice. He's an authority not only in the country, but worldwide. And uh, even though we have a lot of political um, coming out from Washington, uh, for the most part, uh, what comes out of uh, uh, Dr. Fauci and most of what the CDC puts out is um, is is good advice, and we tend to follow it uh, uh, for the most part. Uh, I don't. When I hear this political messaging, I filter out what what doesn't make sense to us from a scientific or medical standpoint. Can you talk, Dr. Gonzalez Ayala, about Thanksgiving um, and what this means for El Paso? What message are you putting out right now? And also, if you could talk about being a pulmonologist and what that means, the kind of deadly combination, if you could talk more about the flu as well as COVID. Well, the, the, the message we're trying to, to send again is, please, to everybody, uh, avoid uh, celebrating uh, uh, in person uh, it sounds terrible. Uh, it sounds like a draconian measure, but we're asking people not to go and visit anybody. I'm following up with patients that have recovered already from COVID over the last few months in my office via telephone encounters. And I have a lot of patients asking, hey, Dr. Gonzalez, can I go and visit uh, my relatives in Houston or my relatives in California, I'm pleading with them, please don't go anywhere, stay put, even though you already caught COVID and we assume you have some immunity, you can still catch another, you know, virus, you can catch influenza. Stay put, don't go anywhere and uh, sit out this holiday so you can celebrate next year. Now to the question of what it means to be a pulmonologist and dealing with this, I think that uh, it's the experience uh, that I had never been uh, exposed to. We're seeing uh, this uh, go completely beyond the point where we usually see it uh, with the influenza peak in the, in the months of January and February, where we have, yes, a lot of patients waiting for beds in the ER, but never to this ex extent. It's way beyond, never seen it before anywhere. And I've worked in, in Miami and I worked in Houston and obviously here in El Paso, I've never encountered these kinds of uh, extremes uh, where we're overrun with uh, patients that are critically ill. Well, Dr. Emilio Gonzalez Ayala, we want to thank you so much for being with us, leading pulmonary disease and critical care specialist. This is Democracy Now! When we come back, we go from El Paso, which is one of the hot spots of this country, to North Dakota, which currently has the highest COVID-19 death rate 
in the world. We will talk with a member of the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe, and we'll go to Navajo Nation in Arizona, which is now going through yet another lockdown. Stay with us.